Um, and, uh, you know, you want to make the right decisions with the information that you have at hand. And you want to try and get as much information as you can uh, without too much delay. And ultrasound really fits into this. So with that, I come to the, first, the greatest pitfall. And that is actually not using ultrasound when you are looking after the sickest people who present to the hospital. You guys are the ambassadors for the hospital. Um, these patients are looking to you to help them. Uh, you know, you need to get this right. A lot of people tell me that, you know, you want to call a friend, to get an echo done. Okay. You know, oftentimes uh, this does not pan out. Uh, you know, uh, you are better off doing this yourself and learning how to do this yourself. Um, so just going through how you would assess a patient who comes in in shock uh, into resource. You have uh, your monitor, um, you know, you have your skin perfusion, you have with ultrasound quite a, you can add a lot more information very, very quickly. If you take ultrasound out of the equation here, all you really have is just a monitor and your fingertips. The clinical exam is important, absolutely. Um, you know, I assess, my uh, I assess patients with shock by putting my hand on their extremities, on the center, to see what the skin temperature is, because that gives you a very quick idea of what your systemic vascular resistance looks like. Uh, without actually having to go and do like really complicated calculations. That is the best indicator of shock with this patient and helps to delineate any information that you get further on from other assessments. With shock, anybody who comes with shock to the emergency department, okay, I, I believe that they really need a systematic exam, a focused exam with point of care ultrasound. And this is where the rush exam comes in. So the rush exam was uh, initially, um, uh, I suppose, talked about uh, uh, by Scott Weingart back in 2009. And it, it, you know, there have been a few iterations and a few additions uh, into it, so much so that it's the rushed exam. Okay, so um, the um, involves getting views of uh, uh, the uh, harsh, the IVC. Morrison's pouch, EFAST exam, um, your aorta, your pneumothorax, and then uh, as an addition, um, uh, looking for an ectopic, uh, looking for DVTs. Now, uh, there are other, uh, obviously, um, uh, protocols out there. EGLS is more uh, focused on ultrasound of uh, the IVC, uh, lungs, and harsh and uh, you know having a systematic approach is very important regardless of whatever uh, approach you de decide to take so in EGLS it's like is there a uh, pneumothorax is there a tamponade is there a hypovolemic or distributive shock and uh, is there LV dysfunction and then finally is there RV strain um, the heart is a pretty complex organ uh, as you can see it has uh, four chambers um, you know, the right side, the left side, all slightly different. Uh, if you have right-sided failure, you know, the treatment is very different from left-sided failure. And uh, if you are facile with point-of-care ultrasound, um, you know, getting a few views of the heart will actually tell you what kind of shock you're, uh, you're dealing with and how you can actually treat this the, way, uh, the best way. So some pro tips for um, uh, echocardiography. Uh, if you're not doing this every day, I appreciate that, you know, some of the uh, views can be quite difficult. Um, so how you hold the probe, okay? You need to hold the probe uh, like a pen. Uh, don't hold it like a dead rash or holding it like a sock, a dirty sock that you're trying to put into the, uh, the, the washing machine. Hold it with the probe, uh, hold the probe like a pen, rest your hand on the patient's chest. Uh, that gives you a lot more stability and uh, stops you from uh, sliding off the patient's chest as you're trying to get that important view. Uh, use lots of jelly. Uh, you know, as you get more experience, the amount of jelly actually uh, that you use uh, gets less and less and less. Uh, but initially, try and use lots of jelly to make sure that you, the probe has good contact with skin. Uh, then exert pressure, okay? Uh, exert pressure where to the point it's slightly uncomfortable, 
And then when you think you have reached that point, exert a little bit more pressure. Um, you know, it's important that you get good contact with skin. Air is at the enemy of ultrasound. So if you don't use sufficient pressure, you will not get a good image. Remember to use dynamic maneuvers. Use uh, the left lateral position, get your posi uh, patient positioned. Um, even in the ICU, we can get uh, patients uh, who are intubated, ventilated on dialysis. We usually can get them into a kind of a semi left lateral position by just propping pillows behind them on the right side. Uh, you know, and then you kind of uh, can sit on the bed and, uh, you know, perform the examination. Patients who are able to obey commands, uh, you know, they can, um, to improve your images, you can actually get them to breath hold, uh, you know, for, uh, for echo, if you're doing, uh, if you get them to exhale and hold their breath at that point, for even for a second or two, you'll be able to get quite good images on the anterior chest wall. Um, if you get them to take a big breath in, if you have problems getting a subcostal view, get them to take a big breath in and hold it there. That pushes the heart down. You will be able to get a good view of the subcostal area then. And one last point, don't look at your hand position. Look at what's happening on the screen. Look at how the image actually relates to your probe, your uh, uh, movements of the probe. So... Uh, we'll just go into this uh, very, very briefly. Uh, so this is uh, your subcostal view. Uh, keep your hand on top of the probe. Uh, keep the probe quite shallow. You should get a view like this. You should see four chambers of the heart. Uh, this is a good uh, view for evaluating uh, pericardial effusions, uh, you know, relative uh, LV or uh, RV distension uh, and your LV function as well. Um, you got a shot of the liver in the, in the near field, okay, right up here. This is your right ventricle, uh, right ventricle here, right atrium here, left atrium here, left ventricle there. Uh, you, can go, you can go do your uh, parasternal long axis, which is the second or third intercostal space, uh, just lateral to the, uh, the sternal border. Uh, this, this, is, this view is best gotten with the patient in a left, uh, semi-left lateral view that so just pushes the heart closer to the skin, moves the lung out of the way, uh, lots of jelly, some pressure, good, uh, hold, uh, hold the probe well, you should be able to get a pretty good image. This is what you're going to get. So again, from f f near field to far field, uh, this is your right ventricular outflow tract. Okay, this is your um, ascending aorta, aortic valve. This is your left ventricle. Okay, this is your mitral valve. This is your left atrium. Uh, this is your descending thoracic aorta. In this view, what you're looking for is a one is to one is to one ratio. So the diameters or the measurements of the right ventricle, the um, ascending aorta, and the left atria should all be in a one is to one is to one ratio. So they should all look about the same size. If you have enlargement of the right ventricle, uh, so say, say maybe you get a two is to one is to one ratio. Uh, then what could possibly be happening is that you're getting some RV dilatation. Is that due to um, RV failure? Uh, you know, do you have a big PE? If you get a one is to two is to one ratio, then you got to suspect that there's something going on here. If your patient is shocked, does the patient have uh, um, an ascending aortic aneurysm? Okay, uh, what's even worse is if you see a one is to two is to one and you see a pericardial effusion. Okay, so a pericardial effusion will be seen here and in the far field in the pericardium. The pericardial effusion will go between the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the harsh and the uh, descending aorta. Okay, and that differentiates it from a pleural effusion, which happens, uh, it goes, uh, the uh, uh, pleural effusion will go around the, the aorta and does not go between it and the heart. Um, that would be even more, those findings of a pericardial effusion and a dilated um, um, aorta uh, would be obviously very suggestive of a dissection of the uh, ascending aneurysm, ascending thoracic aneurysm. Uh, dilation of the uh, left atria is probably a more chronic process and I wouldn't worry about it too much, uh, but it would suggest that you have high filling pressures in the uh, um, left ventricle. And if you're considering that uh, giving fluid or volume to this patient, you want to be a little bit careful if they already have high filling pressures because any bit more fluid could actually tip them into pulmonary edema. So that's for your 
parasternal long axis view, uh, you rotate your probe then 90 degrees um, from the, um, uh, uh, the best position of your parasternal long axis to give you your parasternal short axis view. And with your parasternal short axis, this is the view that you should get. Uh, your left ventricle is here. This is your mid papillary view. This is your mitral valve. So we're just scanning through all of it. Over here, this structure here is the um, uh, right ventricle. So it's almost like a donut, the left ventricle, and then uh, a cross on kind of stuck onto the side of the donut is your right ventricle. Um, now, uh, the apical four chamber view is, uh, uh, sub I suppose people find this the more difficult view to get. Um, your probe uh, should be, uh, you know, uh, big movements initially, uh, just the intercostal space below the nipple in uh, female patients, um, you know, put it into the uh, inframammary crease, uh, direct the probe towards the right scapula because that's the plane that the heart will lie in. Move the probe around in big circular motions initially to try and get a view and then after that slowly, um, uh, you know, dial down on where the best view is. Pro marker should be kind of towards the two o'clock to three o'clock position. The view you should get is one of, um, you know, uh, the LV should be the center. Okay. This is your RV over here. This is your RA. This is your LA. This is your mitral valve, tricuspid valve. This gives you a good global function. You can certainly tell whether there's a pericardial effusion. You can tell about LV function. You can decide on the, the um, relative uh, interplay between your uh, right ventricle and your left ventricle. Now, after all of that, uh, you know, what are you looking for? Okay, so uh, obviously in your subcostal view, if you see something like this, uh, like a man jumping on so uh, someone's right ventricle, you will obviously be uh, you know, quite concerned about tamponade. Pericardial fusions do not have to be large to cause very severe shock. Um, this obviously is uh, not a good sign. Uh, so you can see here uh, the uh, left atrium, uh, oh, sorry, the right, uh, 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 the right atrium is being uh, pushed down in uh, early diastole. Uh, the right ventricle is also almost non-existent in this pretty large pericardial fusion. Okay, if this person is shocked, they look clapped out. Um, they're going to need a needle in this space. Okay, this is uh, uh, another interesting one. This is a, a sonographic, uh, um, you know, if you wonder what pulses alternance looks like uh, uh, visually, this is what pulses alternance looks like on your ECG. Uh, you know, if you plug it in an ECG properly, you'll see the, the QRS complexes uh, alternating. Um, so this is also worrying for tamponade. Um, you know, I think the best way of describing it is, uh, I suppose, John Travolta. Um, you know, doing Saturday night fever, okay? Uh, you can see how the movement of the RV is collapsing, all right? So I suppose, uh, you know, no, no, no um, um, presentation on ultrasound is, uh, is uh, complete without some stories. So these are all real patients that, uh, you know, I've seen over my time using point of care ultrasound. So uh, first, this first lady here was MC. So she was a, you know, she, she was a 73-year-old female, had a pretty soft blood pressure, 90 on 50, cap refill time was five, you know, she was a bit shocked, she was quite shocked, lactate of five, you know, she, very non-specific symptoms, abdominal pain, urinary frequency, chest pain, uh, a little bit of uh, everything. Uh, she was diagnosed with urosepsis, given some volume, she, blood pressure uh, improved a little bit. She was sent on the, she was sent to the ward, um, uh, we were contacted, uh, the ICU team were contacted later on to come and review this patient because, you know, after she had uh, probably about three liters of fluid, she was not getting any better. In fact, she was getting worse. Her lactate was going up to 12. Her blood pressure had now dropped to 70 on 30. Her uh, radio pulse was not palpable. Uh, her cap refill time was in the order of six or seven. So she was getting worse and worse and worse. The problem was that this diagnosis of sepsis is fraught with premature closure, diagnostic bias, um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, cog there's so many cognitive biases here. Because once you say someone has sepsis, they're almost, uh, you know, pushed into a, 
um, a space where they get the fluid, they get their uh, antibiotics, and uh, you know they are all assumed to get better after that. But nobody actually goes to look at the heart. And when you go to look at the heart, this is what you actually see. Okay, so she's got a pericardial fusion here. All right, you can see here that her RV is actually collapsing. Okay, almost non-existent in this subcostal view. Um, the uh, uh, in the apical four chamber, you can see that the uh, uh, right atrium is actually collapsing in diastole. So this heart is not actually filling on the right side. Um, you know, she needed a needle decompression, so she got. Um, uh, you know, uh, we got we did an ultrasound guided um, uh, drain um, uh, and uh, aspirated probably about. 10 to 15 mils and uh, you know the uh, uh, her shock status improved remarkably um, so don't uh, forget that the other lady this is uh, this is one that i think probably a lot of people are quite familiar with uh, you know a uh, young lady at 4 a.m comes in has high bmi uh, she's short of breath doesn't have chest pain she has cough productive of phlegm 38.4 degrees Celsius, you know, she's multiple like SERS criteria, um, you know, blood pressure of 80 on 50, lactate of four, you know, she's got, uh, she's been stamped with the respiratory sepsis, put on antibiotics, put on some fluids, uh, hope you get better. Um, but nobody actually looks at a heart. Um, you know, when you do actually look at a heart, you can see here in your peristernal long axis, the RV is dilated. You can see it's actually pushing into the LV. Um, when you look at the peristernal short axis, you can see that this is not the donut with the croissant uh, uh, curved over it. This is actually what we call the D sign. Okay, so it's suggesting RV over pressure. Um, the pericardium is a fixed space. It's a zero sum game. If the RV dilates, the LV has to decrease in size. So if you had a shock state, the shock state only gets worse as your RV dilates because your, R, uh, your LV uh, is getting smaller, and by uh, convention, your uh, cardiac output will decrease as well because of that. Uh, apical four chamber here, you can see the RV is still pretty dilated. Okay, so the conversation, uh, the 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 tr appropriate treatment for this lady was: it, does she get um, uh, TPA? Okay, so she fulfills the criteria for getting thrombolysis. All right, so she's, she's put on a, a actylized um, um, uh, altiplase uh, infusion and, uh, you know, the hemodynamics markedly improve uh, within a couple of hours. Um, now, in terms of her LV function, in terms of function, uh, you know, when you look at LV function, you know, people say, oh, you know, it's very difficult to tell. Um, you need, certainly need a bit of experience with this. Uh, so that's why I recommend trying to echo most people that come into the department. If they have a little bit of chest pain or, you know, if they are shocked, certainly have a look at their heart uh, because you will quickly recognize when the mitral valve is actually, um, you know, uh, moving well or not moving so well. Okay, so this is a moderately depressed uh, LV and this is a normal LV. Uh, and then if you contrast it with this, so this is an, uh, a mitral valve that's hardly moving at all. This, so this is a really severely depressed LV function, okay? We talk about some wall motion abnormalities as well. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you look at this parasternal short axis, okay? So it's got, um, you know, almost a full house of the uh, uh, wall motion abnormalities. You can see here that this wall here, not moving. This wall here, uh, a little bit hypokinetic, it's not actually thickening very well. And in this case here with systole, the wall, the interventricular septum is actually bowing in the opposite direction, okay? So, so that is uh, the wall motion abnormalities. Um, patients who have STEMIs, uh, one thing I'll say is actually, I know, uh, you know, once they have a STEMI, again, you know, everybody goes, right, you know, we need to get to cath lab, we need to get to a cath lab. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, they do need to get a cath lab, um, but always have a look. Uh, you know, it only takes you a minute or two to do a high map exam. Uh, you know, it'd be pretty silly for them to try and uh, if the low blood pressure has caused, you know, um, uh, these ST elevations, but in actual fact, the, you know, if the, uh, if the low blood pressure was caused by say a, a ruptured triple A, you know, uh, that would be pretty uh, interesting for the cardiologists in the, uh, the cardiac cath lab or if they had a pericardial effusion and uh, you saw a dilated aortic uh, outflow tract, 
uh, you know, that would certainly be suggested of dissection. And, you know, certainly PCI is not going to fix that problem. Um, uh, you can link your uh, uh, various uh, coronary artery territories to uh, the various walls. Uh, you know, you can look uh, look this up on uh, Ben Smith's website. Uh, you know, he's uh, found on Twitter at uh, Ultrasound Jelly. Um, now, uh, so we go from the heart to the IVC. Um, so the IVC, you know, is often not, okay? Uh, it's a pretty sad creature these days. Uh, everybody seems to think that the IVC uh, is a bad thing to look at. I don't think it is. Um, I think everybody looks at it kind of in the wrong way. Um, so this is the view that you are normally taught to look at the IVC. So this is the longitudinal uh, view of the uh, IVC. You can see, uh, you may think that this is a pretty round structure, doesn't really uh, change with very much respiration. Um, but, uh, you know, I suppose, you know, with, uh, as with most things in radiology, uh, you want to look at things in both angles. So like with this, you know, you may think, uh, you know, this guy is uh, trying to give the finger to the, the, the press core, but in actual fact, you know, he's just saying, well, you know, there's uh, three people, three things that we need to look out for. Um, you need to look at the IVC in the short axis because that same structure that we saw earlier on, um, if you look at this, you can see that it's actually not that round. It's actually, there's a bit of movement in it. Okay, and uh, all that is, is just a rotation of the probe in 90 degree fashion. Um, so it depends on how you look at the IVC. If you look at it this way, or if your probe is slightly tilted and you're looking in that direction, as you slice it, you know, the, the diameter looks slightly different. Uh, this is kind of an ellipsoid. So this is kind of what we would almost consider euvolemia or maybe slightly hypovolemic. Uh, and contrast that to an IVC that's actually fully dilated in the short axis. So you can see that this is fully, fully round. Um, and this is a truly, truly dilated IVC. Uh, try not to use the IVC to um, decide on fluid responsiveness. Um, the IVC is good in the extremes of conditions. So if it's really, really small or really, really large, it just tells you whether this patient is able to tolerate fluid. I don't use the IVC to tell, tell me whether this patient is gonna uh, improve their hemodynamics by giving them fluid. I'm going to use the IVC to try and figure out whether I'm gonna cause the patient any harm by giving them any fluids. If you had a patient with uh, an IVC this size, uh, you know, it would suggest that if you gave them 500 mils of a crystalloid bolus, you're not, probably not gonna do them any harm. Um, if you have a patient who is shocked, um, you know, and uh, maybe it's a traumatic uh, uh, cause of shock that you've uh, determined, and you are looking at their shock stage and you're wondering why are they still shocked? They've had uh, most of their, um, a lot of um, uh, uh, blood products already at this stage. You have to, if you see an empty IVC, you have to consider whether they, still, they are still bleeding. If it's full, uh, you have to consider whether they have developed obstructive shock from tamponade or um, uh, you know, a tension pneumothorax uh, preventing forward flow of blood in the, uh, uh, from the IVC into the right ventricle. Um, let's talk about uh, the EFAST exam. So everybody's uh, bread and butter is the EFAST exam uh, in emergency medicine. Uh, you know, uh, your right upper quadrant, your uh, um, uh, pelvic view, your left upper quadrant, and then a subcostal view of the heart. Um, so uh, I tend to do my FAST exam in this way. Uh, so I use the right upper quadrant first, um, followed by the pelvis in the longitudinal view only. And uh, the last view I look at is the left upper quadrant. Because of the uh, paracolic gusher in the right upper quadrant is a little bit lower than the left upper quadrant, blood uh, or free fluid tends to track into the right upper quadrant first. Um, you usually tend to see in the paracolic gusher or the caudal tip of the liver. Uh, you know, even if you had a splenic laceration or a splenic rupture, uh, the free fluid usually tends to appear in the right upper quadrant, funnily enough. Um, so having a look at these images, um, make sure you scan through the whole organ. If you look at the picture on the, uh, the clip on the left, you may say, hey, look, you know, there's no free fluid. I've imaged Morrison's pouch and uh, there doesn't seem to be any free fluid at all. But make sure you look lower down. So if you over here, you can see that the free fluid is actually just starting 
in the, the caudal tip of the liver coming into the inferior pole of the kidney, okay? Uh, you know, free fluid doesn't tend to uh, uh, occur on the right side above the diaphragm. So this is the space that you want to look at in the right upper quadrant. Uh, and then if you look into the paracolic gutter, then you will see free fluid here as well. Okay, so it's called the tip of the liver, paracolic gutter. Make sure you look in this space before you say that the right, right upper quadrant is clear. Um, this is the um, uh, bladder view, uh, so uh, pelvic view. So this is the bladder in long axis, okay? Uh, not catheterized yet, uh, but you can see again, free fluid in the, uh, um, uh, in the pelvic view. Uh, the left upper quadrant is uh, interesting. So it's uh, rare enough that you actually find this uh, uh, free fluid uh, between the spleen and uh, the, the, the uh, kidney or the diaphragm. Uh, so, sorry, the sp spleen and the kidney. Uh, most of the free fluid, if you find it on the left side, will be actually between the spleen and the diaphragm because the attachment between the spleen and the kidney is usually really tight. Uh, and free fluid doesn't usually track in there. It usually tends to track above um, the spleen between the diaphragm. Okay. Uh, so the aorta, so quick word about the, let's, let's talk uh, uh, aortic assessment. Okay, so, uh, you know, a lot of people are quite, uh, you know, uh, they feel that they are quite happy with doing aortic examinations, um, you know, especially on patients in uh, ultrasound courses, uh, because all the uh, models that you get for ultrasound courses are already svelte and thin, um, and uh, they have no body fat. So it's very easy to image the aorta. Uh, so much so that everybody gets these uh, um, uh, images when you go, go to scan at an ultrasound conference or an ultrasound course. Um, but, uh, you know, reality kind of bites in that, you know, a lot of the patients who have uh, aortic disease, they're fast, they have food, uh, they've probably eaten before they come in, uh, they're a little bit hairy, uh, and, uh, you know, they may, they may have, uh, you know, a lot of gas in there as well. So much so that uh, when you try and do an aortic examination, this is what you tend to see. Um, you know, so your uh, teaching, your traditional teaching would tell you to start from the epigastrium, work your way down to the bifurcation. Um, but anatomy kind of tells you that uh, doing it a slightly different way is actually uh, more intuitive, that if you start lower down at the belly button and work your way up or work your way down from there to the, the, at the bifurcation, um, that will make a lot more sense because the aorta, as you can see over here, is a lot more um, anterior because of your low doses of your lumbar spine. So start at the bifurcation, start at your belly button and then move up or down because then you can localize where this is. Just a separate word as well about uh, the aorta. Instead of looking for this, uh, 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 the aorta over here, always look for the uh, vertebral body first because the aorta is always uh, located very close to that. Okay. Um, so screen through the aorta as we see here down to the bifurcation, okay? Um, you know, and uh, we can give you this example uh, of uh, uh, diagnostic bias uh, where this patient comes in uh, complaining of loin to groin pain. Uh, he says it comes and goes, uh, you know, there's no history of trauma. Those are his vital signs. Um, you know, uh, uh, someone thought uh, uh, his GP, he had seen his GP about a week ago with this same little pain, uh, you know, and has presented late to the department. Uh, this is what he looks like. If, you know, if you went down the route of getting a renal ultrasound, uh, if there was a stone, uh, you may see dilation of the ureter over here, uh, or, uh, you know, you may see a stone in the vesicular ureteric junction. But in this case, uh, you know, if you're going to scan uh, this, make sure you have a look at his aorta, because in actual fact, the aorta can really screw you up, uh, because the symptoms are never, never, never really classical tearing uh, pain. Uh, you know, they present with intermittent pain, they can present with uh, uh, right upper quadrant pain. Uh, you know, the triple A's that I've diagnosed in the ED with, uh, you know, uh, ultrasound, you know, none of them have uh, the, the, the classic story that you get from the textbooks. Um, uh, so again, screen through, uh, make sure you screen through. Um, so you can see here, large triple A, okay. Uh, and outer wall, measure the outer wall to outer wall. Okay, you can see the vertebral, uh, vertebral body at the back here. Uh, again, another one, another AAA here. All right, don't measure the lumen. 
Okay, that's not the that's not the problem. It's actually the wall-to-wall -wall diameter that you're looking for. Um, again, another one. Uh, okay, there's uh, quite a lot of wall thrombus here. You can see there's uh, even thrombus going in there. Um, okay, this is in the long axis. You can see here, this is all clot or thrombus. Uh, okay, so be facile with this. You scan, um, I think uh, they did a study where you scanned a hundred, if, if you scanned a hundred aortas, you're gonna save some, uh, one life at the very least. Um, last, uh, last but not least, uh, the pneumothorax. Um, so uh, with pneumothoraces, uh, you know, I think most people use this uh, quite regularly. Uh, lung sliding, no pneumothorax at this point. Uh, over here, you can see no lung sliding, quite highly suggestive of a pneumothorax. Um, if you look for the uh, lung point, uh, this is almost 100% specific, specific for a pneumothorax. This is where the lung is actually starting to collapse away from the, the rib cage. Um, some uh, pitfalls here. Um, if you look at this, okay, um, you know, you may think that uh, there is no pneumothorax because you saw a bit of sliding there. Um, but just be aware of where your... Um, uh, where your pleural line starts, because your pleural line is below a rib. And so this is your rib here. This is not the pleural line. This is actually subcutaneous emphysema. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, now, ectopics, uh, you know, uh, this has to be contextual. Uh, you have to take this in um, context. If you have a patient with abdominal pain, young patient, uh, female, abdominal pain, uh, you know, with a positive HCG, uh, if you scan the bladder and you look at the uterus and you see the uterine stripe, so this is an empty uterus, uh, you know, you'd be very, uh, it'd be very highly suggestive of an ectopic pregnancy. Now, in this clip, you can actually see a gestational sac that is not in the uterus. So this is uh, what we would consider an ectopic pregnancy. All right. So, uh, but, you know, you didn't need to see this uh, gestational sac to be able to call this as a possible um, ectopic pregnancy because there is no, there's no fetus in the uterus with a positive pregnancy test. Um, DVT scanning um, is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, compression, if you apply compression to the veins, you should see that it coll uh, collapse. If they don't collapse, then you've got to be concerned about uh, clot. Um, and that all figures into the, um, uh, into the patient, uh, how you would manage patient with shock. Uh, you know, if they have RV dilatation uh, and they have a clot, uh, you know, the conversation then should be, are you going to thrombolize this patient? Is this patient stable enough to survive a CTPA? Um, so take home points. If the patient presents in shock, uh, you know, they should get an ultrasound as part, you know, they should get a focused uh, high map rush exam as part of the examination, uh, as part of the clinical examination. Um, you know, uh, and however, which way you choose to do this protocol, it should, uh, it should be completed on them. Um, the reassessment is the beauty of ultrasound because you can actually always go back to look again. Uh, you know, it's not like you have to transport the patient to a CT scanner again to see whether you, uh, you know, what you have uh, given them as initial management, whether that has worked. As you can see here, collapsing IVC, hyperdynamic left ventricle, um, dry lungs here, okay, because you see A lines and some sliding. Uh, you're giving them maybe two liters of volume, and uh, you know uh, maybe they are still shocked. Uh, maybe their oxygen requirements have gone up. Reassess them at ultrasound. Uh, this may be what you see: a dilated IVC. Now, um, you know this is uh, B lines here in the lung uh, lung views. The heart now looks uh, pretty full. Uh, function looks reasonably okay, but uh, at this point here, if they are still shocked, you have to consider whether they actually need vasopressors rather than more volume. Um, and it's always good to incorporate, uh, you should always incorporate focus into your clinical examination. Um, and uh, like these uh, guys here on the Walker Leisure, um, you know, they're always better together. And that's me. Um, so, um, 
Oh yeah, wow, well within time. <laughs> um, okay, so if you have any questions you want to ask, we can take them now. Uh, if you're shy, uh, you can always email them to me uh, or uh, direct message me on uh, my Twitter account. Uh, this uh, QR code brings you to uh, uh, my YouTube channel where I'll try and uh, put uh, uh, clips up or videos up every now and again. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me again. Uh, I suppose to take any questions that you may have.